Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the GRS uh, GoDor and GRS webinar series. Uh, my name is Linda Kellum. I'm the chair of GoDor. Um, and this series, Help I'm an Accidental Government Information Librarian, is brought to you by the Government Documents Roundtable and the North Carolina Library Education Government Resources section. In the future, GoDor will be taking over the webinars and the organizations are working together um, to bring you this series. So thanks for coming. Um, uh, you, we are in a webinar mode for this presentation. Um, so we do encourage you to use the Q&A or the chat box for communicating with our uh, presenter. Um, you can use either one, but if you do use the chat, make sure that you are um, choosing all attendees and panelists so that we can all see your questions. Um, if you have questions specifically for me, feel free to choose my name. You should be able to do that or just choose my name. Um, the, if there are technical issues, please email me at lmk277 at cornell.edu and we'll try to guide you through some solutions. But in the worst case scenario, we are recording this session um, and we will have it up on YouTube, our YouTube channel as soon as possible. Um, we have some plans for new webinars coming up. Uh, you will see uh, our topic for April 22nd is the World Trade Organization. Um, and that is in conjunction with ACRL uh, politics, policy and international relations section. Um, so we're really excited to have uh, them work with us on that one. And then in May, we have uh, someone talking about researching state legislatures. Um, we have more coming in the fall, but if you have ideas for presentations or presentation presenters or presentation topics, please let me know. We are always looking for new topics and new presenters or old topics and old presenters as well. So please just get in touch with me if you have ideas. Um, and I'll put a link to our YouTube channel with our past presentations as soon as possible. Um, please follow us if you are a YouTube user um, and you are free to use any of our past recordings um, for uh, your work um, and you can link to them on live guides. You can do all of that if you would like. So today's webinar is um, researching law in Europe and our presenter is Howard Carrier who has presented with us a couple of times um, before. He's a copyright librarian and liaison librarian to the Departments of Justice Studies and Political Science at James Madison University. Although his work and scholarship is principally in the areas of copyright and fair use, he maintains strong interests in EU law, the law of the European Convention on Human Rights and legal systems and structures. So you're gonna switch over. Should have access to share now. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Linda. I'll go ahead and, and share my screen in, in just a moment. I'm assuming everybody can hear me all right. There's no technical issues of that sort. Okay, jolly good. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you all um, for coming today um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, taking time out of your busy work days to, uh, to sit and, and listen to uh, a, a talk on researching law in Europe and secondly, because I imagine you're just like me and are completely zoomed and WebExed out. So, um, you know, there's, there's times in the normal run of things where a WebEx meeting can be something to look forward to when you sat through hundreds of them in the last 12 months. Um, it's a little bit more uh, arduous. So thank you very much indeed. Let me um, share my screen and pull up the PowerPoint. And um, then as I say, uh, as they say, I will begin so, first of all, the PowerPoint. There it is on my screen. Let me make sure that you can see it on yours. All right, um, I will go ahead and put up the PowerPoint and begin. So I'm guessing uh, you can see the PowerPoint. If you can't, um, please, please go ahead and tell me now. Otherwise, uh, today's talk 
It might be somewhat lacking in the illustration. We can see it. Good. I, I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you, Linda. Um, so, yeah, researching law in Europe. So, um, a, a couple of things about this. Um, first of all, I've done a couple of these in the past, as Linda said. In fact, I've done three. I did one um, some time ago, uh, quite a long time ago, on researching British law. And then another one on researching European law, particularly focused on the European Union. And then relatively recently, I did one on Brexit, um, the great British desire to take aim at your left foot and pull the trigger. Um, today, this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, and I apologize in advance if this is not what you expect. Um, I was giving some thought because those are still valid. I know they've been recorded. I went back and had a, a little look at them. Uh, relatively recently. Some of the database interfaces have changed and some of the functionality has changed a little bit. But those were focused very much on finding things. This one today is a little bit more theoretical and um, I'll explain why. I was sort of I was looking around for an, an, an analogy to explain this to you. And the best one I can come up with is this. Um, in the room where I am sitting, there are where I've been sitting for 12 months, it seems, there are a number of things. Um, there is Shelby the Beagle in her crate, who is appalled at being in her crate. Ordinarily, if this was just a faculty meeting, I'd let her out to destroy things or try to stop her destroying things. Um, but she's safely contained for the next hour. The other thing that exists in great preponderance um, are electric guitars, because like any middle-aged man approaching his midlife crisis, indeed, cresting the wave of his midlife crisis, you go back to the things you did when you were young. And if you're, you know, struggling to persevere with developing as a guitarist, you naturally just buy more of the things because somehow you'll subliminally acquire that expertise. Think of it like this. Um, I'm a reasonably competent guitarist, but I know virtually nothing about musical theory. What I know could comfortably fit on the back of a postcard. And sometimes that's not a good thing. You kind of encounter bumps in the road hurdles, which would be more easily overcome if you knew some musical theory. Um, you know, I can tell you that the F sharp minor pentatonic sounds very nice over an A major chord, but I can't tell you why. And so today, it's a little bit looking at the underlying theory, how the pieces lock together. There will be some description of finding. There will be some demonstration of relevant databases. But what I'm really trying to do is lay out, without being turning into a constitutional law lecture, the underlying theory. Because I think for those who don't know too much about this, the underlying theory might be quite helpful. And I also say this because when I first arrived in the United States 16 years ago, having trained as a lawyer in the United Kingdom, I found myself thinking, well, how much different can it be? You know, they're both common law systems. Common law is common law. Um, you know, what, 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 what difficulties could possibly exist without understanding or even beginning to realize until I sat down in Chapel Hill Law Library as I was Finishing off a PhD I wasn't desperately interested in, which never actually got finished. I went to Sills and became a librarian instead, but suddenly realized that US law is codified. The British don't do that. Common law is common law. It isn't always. So, you know, a big part of this has been inspired by my own journey, understanding the legal structure of a different country. So what is the webinar about? Well, putting together or putting the pieces together of researching law in the quasi-federal European landscape. I'll talk quite a bit about this quasi-federal idea. It's pretty intrinsic to, again, how these, these pieces are put together. Some of the different legal models that prevail in Europe and how it affects research and particularly how it affects um, the type of research I'm going to be talking about today, which is primarily um, how intergovernmental organizations um, have intertwined themselves uh, within domestic legal systems in Europe. Using some noteworthy examples from European jurisdictions to highlight these ideas. So, yeah, um, useful things to, uh, to, to kind of amplify these. I'll point to some of the key research tools, but those are really the, the subject of the previous webinars. Um, so 
in the in the Europe one, I went through EU Lex, I went through InfoCuria in great detail. I shan't be doing that today, other than to point to specific examples. Um, attempting and failing not to make this too UK centric. Yeah, I set off with this grand idea of. Um, you know, and there will be reference to other European uh, countries' legal systems. But ultimately, you know, both for language reasons, um, I have some facility in German, schoolboy French, as they say, and some proficiency in English, I think. Um, there is that barrier. Um, but also the fact that it was easier perhaps to make some of these points linked to the UK system. And when I say this, you know, it's when we delve into this, um, Brexit has not drawn a complete line. Uh, between the UK and Europe, despite what some of its more vociferous adherents might be hoping for. Um, I'm thinking about Europe both in terms of simple geographic terms, as well as the, the jurisdictional issues that arise. And when we get to the EU section of this, you'll see, um, as I'm sure many of you are already aware, that um, EU law still um, has a very uh, heavy um, presence uh, within UK domestic law. And then just discussing some thoughts about the post-Brexit situation. Where did the idea come from? Well, as I said, ironically enough, it came from teaching American university students about their own legal system in the United States. I taught a class called Justice 301 uh, last fall. I hasten to add, I'm not a law librarian. I trained as a lawyer and then in one country and then became a librarian in a different country. And my work today is, as, as Linda mentioned in her introduction, uh, her generous biography, is that I'm a copyright librarian. So apparently all those years in law school weren't wasted. I don't think I could do that as well um, without having um, some sophisticated understanding of, of legal systems and structures. But going back to the class, um, what I observed with the novice um, students is that they really struggled with this relationship between federal and state law in the United States. As we approached the question of how to become a legal scholar, how to read a case, how to read a statute, how to think about sources of law, and then more importantly, to think about how those sources of law interplay with each other in a country, you know, with, with uh, multiple jurisdictions like the US. Um, they really struggled with this, this idea of um, the relationship between federal and state law. Now, I hasten to add that nothing I'm about to show you is recycled from teaching a 300 level justice studies class. But what I've tried to do is accept that there's people, perhaps in this webinar today, with varying degrees of experience from people who are perhaps new to researching law um, here in the United States through to those who are experienced and want to learn a little bit more about um, approaches within Europe. So with all things, these things, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to gauge them. Some things you feel can be quite basic and some things you worry that you're cantering over. If things are complex in a federal legal system or people find them complex, it's likely that they're even more confusing in a quasi-federal one. So I, I'll bear that in mind as I go along. And um, yeah, they struggled with stare decisis, the idea of a precedent, and again, in terms of federal and state law. Because of that, and because one has to be realistic about what can be um, achieved in an in a hour-long webinar, um, I'm going to focus very much on case law today rather than statutes. Um, when we get to talking a little bit about the legal systems, perhaps that will become more obvious. But in terms of finding things today and discussing them, you can assume that this is a webinar about case law. Um, case law has evolved just as a word in the last few decades. It always used to be two words, then it became hyphenated. The legal dictionaries are now compounding it. So case law um, as its own unique entity, if you will. And I'm beginning with the premise that scholars of American law, however sophisticated, are used to dealing with a codified common law system. And that is highly unusual. Um, as I said, it, it, it kind of um, blew my mind when I arrived in the United States. I thought these people are remarkably sophisticated uh, because it doesn't exist in England. It's easier now that we have West law and Lexis Nexis and things like that to find cases decided under a particular statute. But years ago, it wasn't. And if you like, that codification has really been done by legal database providers um, rather than by um, 
you know, the, the US uh, revision, uh, council revision like it happens in the United States. Um, it's not done by a government entity. You could do it to some degree through calls fees and things like that, but it was hard to do. In America, it's always much simpler to find what is the law of the land. You're not plowing through pages and pages and pages of a statute. You're going to the minutely important bits that have been pulled out and presented in the US code. And then you could relatively easily through those legal tools um, find cases decided under those provisions. So that's what I'm assuming that people are used to. I accept that this could be an international audience. If there are European law scholars out there, they're probably going to be um, throwing virtual fruit and, and booing uh, as I progress. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll start with that basis. So lessons from a truly federal nation. In the United States, it's relatively simple because I appreciate that there are entire monographs devoted to the question of whether or not the United States is a true federal system. But by any measure, um, by any objective measure, it is. And you could point to the supremacy clause that makes things relatively easy. Article 6, paragraph 2 tells us that the federal constitution and federal law generally takes precedence over state laws. When there is conflict of law, the federal law prevails. Um, this is the, the method or the, the lesson of true federalism. So why did the students find it so hard to understand? Um, well, we can also look to a little bit to the obligation of state courts under the supremacy clause. And this is actually very relevant um, to what I'll be talking about in the European context in a few minutes time. Um, state courts are bound to give effect to federal law when it is applicable and to disregard state law when there is a conflict. So the supremacy of federal law in this federal system is arguably not under any serious doubt. In those instances in a common law system in the United States, like the United States, or specifically in the United States, in other words, where federal law doesn't provide, but state law does, the Erie Doctrine as um, you know, beloved, or maybe not beloved, of 1L law students throughout the nation as they begin their JD programs. The Erie Doctrine as consolidated or refined in Hannah and Plummer is pretty straightforward. Um, where the federal law does not provide and the federal courts are sitting in judgment, they simply do not create judge-made law. Instead, they look to state law, um, state practices, as is stated in Hannah and Plummer. And this a, a, appears in certain circumstances. It's not universal, but we're thinking in terms of where there is diversity, um, a venue, if you will, um, where state laws collide. There are also some questions of quantum related to this, as I believe. But in other words, you don't simply supplement federal judge-made law where existing state law exists in the common law or indeed um, within statute. So in this sense, this is a model of federalism which is relatively easy to understand. We talked about stare decisis, which they found quite confusing in the context, again, of the relationship between federal and state law. When are the federal courts adjudicating, um, offering judgments and opinions on the nature of state law? And to what extent the state courts um, question um, or you know, um, involve themselves in interpreting federal law? Ironically enough, given that we are dealing with the American system, this comes from Onsbrook University, but it's a nice little diagram that shows the question that arises or how this can be interpreted. Um, where the courts bind themselves and on what matters. So you're seeing there um, courts being bound on questions of federal law and binding on questions of state law. And the blue line that goes up from state Supreme Courts to the US Supreme Court is significant. Um, it tells us that um, in those instances, the United States Supreme Court um, is bound to give uh, consideration to state law when it is adjudicating on those matters. Again, they struggled with this, this question, this, this question of precedent. And I, I wondered whether it was simply um, being confronted with unfamiliar legal terms. And so we spent a lot of time going over this. Um, but the idea of courts being able to bind themselves. And again, within the federal system of the United States, this, I wouldn't say it's necessarily logical, 
Um, but it's relatively easy to understand. We're looking at courts that essentially are bound by um, you know, the hierarchy of the courts, from the Supreme Court um, to federal courts um, in their districts and then subsequently U.S. district courts. And we're seeing that um, you know, the U.S. Court of Appeals in the same district essentially binds itself. We talked a lot about the United States Supreme Court's ability or inability to bind itself, and we accept it, as we will see with the European courts. But once you're dealing with these constitutional courts, um, stare decisis within that particular court doesn't necessarily mean a great deal. Um, there are many, many instances of the Supreme Court essentially reversing itself from, you know, taking one position. You know, the most obvious example is Roper and Simmons and the execution of people who committed their crimes as minors um, or, or applying the death penalty to minors um, or minor criminals. You see within a 25 year period, a noticeable shift. So these were the underlying problems that the students I taught about US federal law and indeed state law um, found. And I wondered, well, that question, if this confusion exists in a relatively certain federal system, it must be even more confusing um, in a quasi-federal system. Yes, wait, I thought this webinar was supposed to be about Europe. It is, don't worry. Um, I was simply trying to apply the lessons um, of, you know, 250 years of American jurisprudence to what is actually a much newer um, jurisdiction. And that sounds rather strange. But of course, in terms of European style federalism, you're only going back to after the Second World War. Um, and we'll be looking at the two big intergovernmental organizations that provide for that, the Council of Europe and the European Union. So whereas in many ways, um, you'd had a constitutional convention in 1787 and then this whole 200 years uh, plus of um, constitutional law developed under that written constitution. In Europe, the system is complicated perhaps both by its novelty, its, its newness, if you will, and also by the fact that as we'll see in a moment, we're not talking about um, a pure federal system. Why call Europe quasi-federal? What um, an excellent idea, what an excellent question. So I looked around for the first instances when this term was used. Um, inevitably, it's used in the United Kingdom. It's used before and around the time of the Maastricht Treaty, and it's used disparagingly in the light of conversations about domestic sovereignty. I can say with confidence, I think, well, maybe I can't because I've only really lived in two countries. My life has almost been split between two, um, my early life in the United Kingdom and my later life in the United States. But if there are two countries that worry about domestic sovereignty the most, I would say it is those two nations. Um, so, so much of this question about this, this, this concern, this criticism of encroaching federalism um, in Europe, this is, if we're drawing a parallel, this is Patrick Henry stuff. Um, maybe because we're in Europe, it's uh, Patrice Henri, but in fact, I would stick with the Anglophone, Anglophone, sorry, um, Patrick Henry, because it is principally um, a British concern. The term first crops up in the 1980s. This is from the Times, Good Europeans, and this is the Times having a good whine about um, quasi-federalist arguments to the contrary. This is not common sense. The EEC is a federal, it's not a federal structure. It's important to remember um, the evolution of the European Union from essentially a coal and steel trading organization um, in the 1950s and 1960s into the EEC, a purely economic community, um, and where you see uh, the beginnings of um, a single market or the transfer to a single market, um, which you know stems from the original treaties of the European Union as it continues to develop the way that single market um, becomes uh, more um, you know, entrenched within Europe. You see the evolution into the European community. And that's really where this, this comes from. Um, 
this quasi-federal term crops up a lot in the 1980s and the late and the early 1990s. And the reason for that is because of the Maastricht Treaty, which is really sets the parameters, the, 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 the three big pillars, as they're called, or were called of the European Union. A shared um, economic environment, a single market, um, a, um, a shared pillar of uh, justice and security matters, um, sorry, uh, of security matters and defense matters. And then ultimately, um, at the third pillar, which is the, the social chapter, um, important social provisions within Europe, the social chapter, which gives rise to workers' rights, if you will, the right to paternity and maternity leave, parental leave, sorry, things like that. Um, in, the, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, particularly in the United Kingdom, this is where this concern about federalism and quasi-federalism really begins to come in. For those who are interested in um, examining in greater detail the federal or quasi-federal nation nature of Europe, um, see this book by, by David Mackay. He's a professor of political science at the University of Essex, Designing Europe, Comparative Lessons from the Federal Experience. Um, a little bit old, but what I've tried to do throughout this, this presentation today is point you um, to some of the, the key resources that might be helpful if you wish to explore these conversations, these questions in greater detail. So here we are, um, as, we, as we move forward, you are dealing with um, a system that has relatively modern intergovernmental organizations beginning the process of what some see as quasi-federalism. So everything I'm gonna say from this point forth, particularly as we look at case law, is going to be linked to this, the interplay between these not top-down, I don't like that term, and they're not federal in the stricter sense, so we'll stick with quasi-federal. Um, EU regulations and directives, regulations being things that have to be applied within the states, directives which give states um, the opportunity to create their own law in such a way that meets the purpose of the European Union directive. We're going to look at the Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights, um, and talk about that in some, some detail too. Um, yes, just a reminder that we are in fact still talking about actually researching law and I promise from this point forth this isn't going to be strictly a constitutional law lecture about European law. So three basic premises to consider as you begin this process. Um, and I would ask you to bear these in mind as you, you know, as, as we as librarians, as we begin the process of um, looking for things for students um, or patrons, sorry, it does help to have this, 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 some of this underlying theoretical knowledge, I think. And I think we can, if you like, condense them down to these. The continent of Europe includes countries with common law systems and civil law systems, which provide some additional consideration for the incorporation of quasi-federal rules within domestic law. Uh, that sounds, having written it, I almost regret that, it sounds awfully pompous, but what it's basically saying is that um, we have to accept that countries do have um, very different legal systems too. Uh, the ones that we used, the ones that we used to in the United States, or indeed the ones I am used to in both the United Kingdom and the United States, and sometimes that does have a bearing on um, how uh, we go about looking for things, or particularly what we should expect to find. Let's say that quasi-federalism can arguably be found in Europe from two leading other intergov. Let's try again. Quasi-federalism can be arguably be found in Europe from two leading intergovernmental organizations, which, as I've told you, are the EU and the Council of Europe. And then there is the question of quasi-federalism or federalism within the states themselves. And the example I'm going to point you to, if I have time, and I think I will at the end of this presentation, is the situation regarding devolution uh, within the United Kingdom. Um, if you like, this is perhaps more of a model in some respects of American style federalism. Um, and certainly those who are opposed to devolution in the United Kingdom have uh, stressed this. 
Um, the example I will point to is Scotland, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish court system, and its relationship with the Westminster Parliament and the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. So what's all this about different legal systems in Europe? Um, let me take a sip of water and I'll explain. Having pointed to a diagram from Onzebrook University to explain stare decisis and the hierarchy of the courts in the uh, United States federal system, I thought it's a pleasing irony to point to Georgetown Law Library to explain what is a civil law system. Essentially, it's this. I really like this definition. Um, a civil law system which places a greater emphasis on statutes as found within various codes instead of case law. The idea of precedent, stare decisis, does not come into play in civil law systems as each case is based on an individual basis, based against that codified law. And then the other thing that typifies these, and this I, I do rather like, is that they are investigatory rather than adversarial in nature. In other words, um, the basic premise is that a court is looking to ascertain if you will, the reality of the situation legally based against the code, as opposed to listening to compelling arguments um, from two quarrelling counsel and perhaps being more compelled by one than the other. Now, the thing to bear in mind with that is you are still basing it against um, legal sources. Um, it isn't, it isn't a, a, a debate society. Um, so as we talk about looking to ratio deciendi in cases, looking at the basic premise, the basic legal reasoning upon which a case or opinion is founded, um, you can see the overlap there. But what you would say is that in the civil law system in France, you are dealing with what is essentially, if you like, the Napoleonic code, if you will, um, as, as adapted. In common law systems like the United Kingdom, and this is from the Open University, um, Primary legal principles have been made and developed by judges to form what is called precedent, where the lower courts are bound to follow principles established by the higher courts in previous cases. Um, common law or judge-made law. I would ask you to bear one thing in mind. When we think about the common law, um, and it is an important distinction, this, it's often written about in legal textbooks or, or legal books generally, as though you are thinking about a distinction between the common law itself, that which just arose from judicial precedent and statute or codes on the other side. And in fact, I would say that in a modern common law system like the United States or the United Kingdom, it's both. You have the supremacy of the statute, um, the, 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 the British uh, Nigel Farage's of this world who worry so much about parliamentary sovereignty would be delighted by that um, statement you know, Parliament is supreme. In other words, the statute takes precedent over the common law. But in fact, you can see the common law as including the statutory interpretation um, provided by the courts. So it isn't just simply the natural flow of, of common law that has developed from the courts, but also the common law that has developed through judicial consideration of statutes. So you do have that initial distinction going into this when you're working with European legal research. Are you dealing with a civil law uh, jurisdiction, in which case precedent is important and all the things that we teach students in the United States about shepherdizing cases, looking for cases that have been um, expressly overruled, those which have been distinguished, is arguably much less important in the civil law system, where, as the Georgetown librarians correctly pointed out, um, two cases which are relatively similar on their facts could theoretically be decided very differently um, based upon the judicial interpretation of the code. So let's actually get into our work for today at a practical level um, because I only have about 25 minutes left. I'm going to begin with the Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Um, for the most selfish reason of all, um, it's probably the area of European law I'm most versed in. 
Actually, that's not true. I studied European Union law to a great extent as well, but I'm much more interested in the ECHR. For those of you who don't know this, I, I'm sorry to state something which is obvious um, for those who do know it. It is extremely important that you do not confuse the European Union and the Council of Europe. They are two completely separate intergovernmental organizations within Europe. Now, increasingly, the lines between them are not being muddied exactly, but rather the relationship between them is growing. In other words, for example, when countries now seek to join the European Union, it is a mandatory requirement that they also um, become signatories, what are called high contracting states, um, to the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. But they are completely separate, and it has been a great disappointment to the so-called Brexiteers to discover, as they got upset about decisions in the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, which they felt went against British interests or British common sense as they saw it in terms of how British law should be applied, to discover that Brexit has done nothing um, to remove them from the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms because Brexit only concerned the EU. There are rumblings and grumblings about a Bill of Rights for the United Kingdom and what it would mean to look, what it would look like to, uh, to come out of the ECHR. I would say to you that would be a very, very different um, position to coming out of the EU, which at its heart um, is still very much a trade organization, a single market. Um, here we are at the ECHR. What is this? Well, as I'm sure most of you know, this is Europe's Bill of Rights. As you can see from the screen in front of you, um, this is our right to be free from inhuman or degrading treatment, the right not to be enslaved, um, the right not to arbitrarily be killed, uh, the right to have criminal charges against you heard by a competent criminal court. Um, these sort of things, um, the link to the charter itself, the convention itself is there. The cases um, arising under the ECHR are heard by the European Court of Human Rights based in Strasbourg in France. Um, it's very important to tell you the European Court of Human Rights is not a court of appeal. Um, it does not have that function which to some degree, for example, uh, the United States Supreme Court does. Its jurisprudence is only limited, is limited strictly to the question of states' conformity with the convention. And you're dealing here mostly with what's called vertical effect. Um, th these terms come up a great deal when you're researching law in Europe, vertical effect and horizontal effect. Um, think of it this way, vertical effect is really the relationship between the state and the individual, and horizontal effect is the application of law between individuals. EU law has both. The possibility does exist um, for both within U European Convention on Human Rights law, but primarily you're dealing with, um, with, with the vertical effect. Um, you're dealing with the relationship between the individual and the state, and the state's ability or inability to co uh, conform. Um, to make its laws suit and adapt and meet the standards required of the European Convention on Human Rights. Cases are brought to the European Court after all domestic remedies have been exhausted. That is fundamental. So it's a court that's looking at whether or not, it's, it's not a court of appeal, it's looking at whether or not a member state, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Italy, whoever it may be, has properly represented uh, the individual's rights as guaranteed under the convention. So this was the comment I was just making about direct effect and um, to an extent there is a horizontal effect as well in the sense that when you're dealing with government agencies, um, things like that, anything which has been touched by government maybe exists under a statutory authority or something like that, um, then yes, that, if you like, is, is the state. And so it's, it's subject to potential review um, by the European Court of Human Rights. But here's the important part. Um, 
the ECHR really, to some degree, has to be incorporated into domestic law. Now, this argument raised 10 years ago by a scholar called Orgenstein is accurate. This, this is a really good definition of it, description of it. Um, but there's more than one way of doing it. In other words, it's not necessarily mandatory to incorporate the law into your domestic system, but you have to have a domestic legal system which at least matches the requirements of the European Convention on Human Rights. And there is the obligation to interpret domestic law in such a way that it complies with the Convention's guarantees. Now, there are different ways of doing this, and um, you'll hear or you'll read a lot about dualist versus monist states. In other words, those which, like the United Kingdom, have attempted a dualist approach, both domestic law and still respecting um, convention law, and others that simply perhaps adopt um, a more laid back approach, if you will, of just relying on the courts to answer questions about ECHR, about the ECHR, as they apply their judgments. Why this is of some relevance, and here, by the way, is the definitive guide to this. This is, if, you're, if you want to understand more about this, this is the, uh, the best source I could find, um, a comparative study of the ECHR at the national level. Um, it really does go through how each country has, has gone ahead and done this. Um, the, the question, sorry, that um, I, I just wanted to amplify, yes, it is uh, necessary to um, appeal all domestic Go through all the domestic courts until you actually bring your case to the European Court of Human Rights. So, reminding ourselves it's not a court of appeal. In a civil law system like Germany, um, introducing the ECHR is relatively straightforward um, because, again, you're dealing with a code. All Germany did was simply point to Article 59, um, essentially, of its um, constitution. Uh, its code and simply use that as a mechanism to say that this is a treaty um, signed on behalf of the Federation lawfully and therefore in a way um, almost the demonist approach but bringing uh, the ECHR into the federal law of Germany. If we look at this example for just a second, um, if it will let me, I think it took me out of full screen mode to do that. Yes, it did. <laughs> Once you start messing around with, with PowerPoint, things become inevitably complicated. Um, let me just grab this and I will I'll quickly show it to you. Um, as oh, Let's go back one click. There we go. Um, so you'll see here a fairly straight, this is a, a German case from 2004. Um, dealing with Article 8 of the Convention, and you see a very logical and, um, you know, approach to this by the Federal Constitutional Court. Sorry, it was actually Article 6, um, uh, Fairness of Criminal Proceedings or Fairness of Court Proceedings, uh, sorry, as well as Article 8. Um, simply the German court saying, well, look, this is included in, in our federal law um, by virtue of it being brought in as a treaty obligation to which um, Germany is committed. And the domestic court just goes ahead and considers it um, based on the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And basically it's an adjudication of the conformity of um, German law with its convention obligations. Go back to the PowerPoint. In the UK, things are a little bit more complicated. You're dealing with the Human Rights Act of 1998, and this is perhaps where common law systems, to an extent, don't have the flexibility, or, or even the inflexibility, see it which way you like, of civil law systems. In other words, the civil law system simply brought in the law and codified it. The code already existed. It existed in the form of the European Convention on Human Rights. In the United Kingdom, you have this problem of basically writing an act, if you will, that goes ahead and, um, to a large degree, simply reflects um, those rights as enshrined in the ECHR, writing them into domestic legislation. The reason this has to be done is twofold. First of all, because you need to ensure conformity with the ECHR. And secondly, there had to be a mechanism um, because of parliamentary sovereignty where the courts would be able 
to make declarations of incompatibility. For constitutional law scholars, that's important. Um, parliament is supreme. So where parliament has made law which directly conflicts with the um, ECHR, owing to the question of parliamentary sovereignty within the common law, the courts do not have the power to just expressly repeal a statute. Only, only parliament can do that. So instead a declaration of incompatibility is made. This statute as it stands does not comply with the ECHR and therefore you're going to have to do something about it. So what I'm going to do for the next five minutes is show you a little bit of this research because it would be a bit unfair to ask you to come to a presentation in a library webinar series and not do some hands-on searching and talk a little bit about that process. Uh, law, legal research, um, I think law because by its very nature is, is really in a way commenting on where society has failed, um, where we cannot simply meet our obligations or promises to one another and so they have to be given legal force um, and in the criminal law sadly of course it's where an individual ostensibly has shown that they are unable um, to conform to if you like the the, 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 the civil contract that, that binds us together and this is such an instance it's a desperately unhappy case um, the murder of a child in my hometown of Liverpool Back in the 1990s, what made it particularly harrowing was the fact that the perpetrators were themselves children. They were only very young, I think they were nine and ten years old, something like that. This case from 1993 became, if you like, the, um, the best example of why uh, the European Convention on Human Rights needs to offer these guarantees, because the old saying that hard cases sometimes make for bad law. That was certainly the experience in the English courts. And when you're left in this uncomfortable position of dealing with two children who have in fact been found guilty of a, a truly horrific murder, there's no reason to go into the, the nature of what they did other than to say that they murdered a two-year-old child. Um, the question of the rights of the child and also just the, the general rights that apply to any um, convicted person, however, heinous their crimes, set us up rather nicely for this kind of conflict. So let's go ahead and follow this through the English courts and the European Court of Human Rights. So researching English law, the very best place to begin, um, B-A-I-L-I-I, -I -I, the British and Irish Legal Information Institute. Let me come out of the PowerPoint for a second, go to Chrome, and I'll show you how I did this, or how you could do this. Um, as ever, citation, particularly in legal um, research, is, is of paramount importance. And um, this would, of course, be much easier if I just found the citation for you, but that wouldn't really be a great deal of fun, would it? Um, it would be rather easy. So instead, we'll go ahead and find it by hand, if you will. Um, we'll do our case law search. Now, the perpetrators of this crime were called Thompson, and the other one was called Venables. There was considerable concern at the time, given their status as children, as to whether or not their names should even be released. Um, subsequently, the courts decided to do that, which in many ways I think probably made uh, the situation much more difficult. But for us as legal researchers, at least we can go ahead and find those cases. Um, these are ex parte cases. Um, they will be the Crown versus the Secretary of State for the Home Department, um, the uh, uh, Home Secretary in effect. Um, but you can have some success, you will have some success searching against um, the uh, defendants, or in this instance, I, actually the plaintiff's names. We could do ex parte venables and let's see if it finds it for us. Um, look at this. Um, we are dealing here with the division between the uh, different legal systems in the United Kingdom. Scottish law has always been, if you will, its own thing. Uh, with the, the question of the, the quasi-federal I'm about to come to as I talk about Scotland. 
Well, Serge, um, it's going to be a House of Lords case or a Supreme Court case. Um, the old uh, judicial division of the House of Lords became the Supreme Court. So if I go ahead and search in here, I should find um, the most, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the appeal by Venables to the highest court in the land, which was then the House of Lords. Okay, there we go. Secretary of State for the Home Department, ex parte Venables and Thompson. So, yeah, the, the ex parte language was important. And you can see this was decided in 1997. This is a pre-Human Rights Act case. And if we look at it, um, you'll see that all the arguments that would then subsequently come up as this was heard at the European Court were pretty much arbitrarily dismissed um, by the House of Lords. The real essence was this, uh, that if the, the plaintiffs, which is what they are, they, in this instance, the tables have turned, um, they are essentially saying two things. First of all, that their rights under Article 3 of the Convention have been breached. And that is because the trial that they received, I remember trials are not televised in the United Kingdom like they are in the United States. They are presented on the evening news in this sort of horrible um, artist rendering. Um, but they were tried essentially at, in an adult court and English criminal courts, particularly uh, at a senior level, not the magistrate's court, but once you get into the high court, are fairly intimidating places. So you had these two children who had no idea really what the nature of the proceedings were, who couldn't even see over the dock, um, confronted by the full spectacle of an English court sitting in its wigs and its robes. So there was that question. But the much more important question was whether or not um, the proceedings themselves had been fair. And the reason that question came about was because uh, the actual tariff they received, the tariff is the penalty that's handed down to prisoners. And with juvenile offenders in the United Kingdom, it's a little bit uncertain. It used to be called being detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. And the person, you know, you would look to the courts to ultimately make the decision about how long in prison they would serve. But this became very highly politicized, particularly because um, the it was a huge situation in England in those days. You know, there were sort of mobs on the streets baying for justice. It was a pretty horrific scene. Um, the Home Secretary decided to intervene to use his um, prerogative powers, if you will. And he decided that the courts set a 15 year tariff. They would serve 15 years in prison. He decided to extend that. Um, a conservative prime minister looking to make uh, the, you know, the position of being very strong on criminal conduct or misconduct. The courts in the English courts dismissed this and said, no, nah, not our problem. Um, you know, they, they received a fair trial and that's all there is to it. You can go and find the European Court of Human Rights decision at Bailey as well. If you want to do that, you would go to where it says databases. Europe, um, the European Court of Human Rights. You can find um, them by case. I happen to know it was in 1999. But if I search for, at the European Court, they went back to um, the initials. So it's actually going to be V. Um, we'll do uh, V versus the United Kingdom. I've only found six of them, and I haven't found it. Maybe it's under Venables. <laughs> I actually, um, it could be T and V. Ah, we'll find it by date. 1999, European Court of Human Rights. It's going to be, they were actually co-joined cases. From memory, it came down, as I recall. Yeah, there they are. T and United Kingdom and V versus the United Kingdom. And this is a decision by the European Court in which they found that the Home Secretary setting the tariff was indeed a violation of Article 6. And this caused particular outrage in the United Kingdom at the time. The more sophisticated way to do this searching is through HUDOC. The HUDOC interface is intimidating. 
Um, but I think I'll find it much more quickly <laughs> through this, ironically enough, that in the, the, the more uh, keyword-based search, common language search of, of Bailey. It is important just to know a little bit about these at the side. Um, originally, the European Court of Human Rights was split between the court itself and its commission. The commission was involved in deciding whether or not the case had merit to even come before the court. Um, some years ago, the commission was abolished and replaced by, if you like, a series of chambers. Um, cases are initially screened by a chamber to see whether or not they meet admissibility requirements. In other words, you know, is it actually a convention case in the first place? Um, has the case actually been adjudicated through the domestic courts before being brought to the European Court of Human Rights? The Grand Chamber um, is, if you like, the, the, the principal um, judicial division of the European Court of Human Rights consisting of 17 judges. When you're looking for the most significant judgments, um, you will want to have both of these checked. But actually, for the most significant ones, you could just have the Grand Chamber checked. Um, we'll go ahead and do our advanced search. Um, we will do uh, V versus, we'll do T, United Kingdom. Search, case of T in the United Kingdom. I prefer this because it gives a Lexis style summary of the case before you go ahead and actually start reading the judgment in its entirety. No violation of Article 3, 3 violation of Article 6, the right to a fair trial. And that violation was founded in the unfair setting of the penalty, the term of imprisonment by a politician rather than by a judge. In the remaining time I have, because I'm almost at time, I'm going to have a breakneck kind of, um, you know, sort of run through this. Um, from uh, that particular case, we then come to um, post-Human Rights Act cases. This is an example of um, a case in which a prisoner was denied access to his correspondence. It happens after the Human Rights Act has been enacted. It's an interesting uh, judgment. Um, by the way, if you were ever confused as to what the letters mean, remember the Cardiff Index to Legal Citation. If you were to go there and just plug in those letters, UKHL, it tells you where it's come from. In fact, it's come from the United Kingdom House of Lords, um, as you can imagine. And um, in this instance, it, uh, you know, we can see it as a Supreme Court case as that came to be. It's where the United Kingdom courts step in and say, there's no point um, doing anything, not doing anything about this, because ultimately it will be appealed, not appealed, but taken to um, the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, this is exactly what the Human Rights Act is designed to do. The prisoner has a right to his correspondence. So at a domestic level, the court ensures compliance with the ECHR. As with the ECHR and the Council of Europe, the same is true in many ways with the European Union. This document here, um, perhaps Linda will share this PowerPoint with you, um, is a really good um, description of the relationship between EU law and national legal systems. But basically you're seeing the same things within the European Union that you're seeing within the ECHR, the obligation to interpret domestic law in a way that complies with European obligations. How has this changed since Brexit? Well, actually not very much. It's an evolving situation. The withdrawal agreement um, that the United Kingdom arrived at with the, United, with the European Union basically respected the fact that um, EU law uh, pertaining to the United, you know, to the United Kingdom as a member state was brought within the um, UK legal system, the domestic legal system, and that was done within the Withdrawal Act as Britain sought to leave the EU. Obviously, that will now change because those no longer have the status really of constitutional statutes. They are statutes which can be made and unmade by the UK Parliament. So as the Brexit situation develops, undoubtedly that will develop too. But it's also balanced against the nature of the withdrawal agreement that Britain arrived at with the EU. Looking for cases um, at the European Court of Justice level, that's Infocuria. You'll find references to that in the webinar I did on European Union law. And lastly, quasi-federalism within the states. And this is the example of Scotland. Um, what has happened here is, as 
Britain moved towards a model of devolution within the late 1990s, principally introduced by the Blair government. Um, you introduced um, a, a legal system within Scotland. The Scottish legal system had always been different, but the creation of a Scottish parliament allowed the Scots themselves to create law, to, to make statute um, on a certain number of matters. There are certain matters which are called reserved, which remain within the province of the Westminster Parliament. But Scotland makes its own law in the areas that are devolved. Um, the flip side of that is Scotland is still represented in the Westminster Parliament as well, as it should be, given that you created this quasi-federal system in which Scotland has some independence and yet is still privy or still subject to UK domestic law in other matters. The Court of Session is Scotland's Civil Supreme Court. In instances that are um, subsequently appealed to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, that Supreme Court does have the opportunity to adjudicate on both devolved and non-devolved issues. So Scotland is an interesting curiosity. Um, some autonomy um, within its own parliament, its own court system, and still subject to, in other instances, to UK domestic law as created by the Westminster Parliament. And there you have it, um, if you like, a more complete federal system to some degree, talked about with relation to the EU and um, the ECHR. I went through that really quickly and I ran four minutes over time for which I apologize. I'm happy to take questions now. I hope it's been of some interest to you. I appreciate it was not a conventional um, library webinar workshop in perhaps exploring the intricacies of the resources that make this information available to us, but rather an overview perhaps so that when you use those, you might understand better how the pieces go together. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you very much, Howard. No, that's, um, th yes, thank you. And it, definitely if you have questions, feel free to um, put them in the Q&A. Um, I uh, will, um, let's see. So there is a question. Um, Barbara is asking, um, she uses Modern Legal Systems Cyclopedia, and she was wondering if that is a good recommendation um, for overviews of legal systems. Absolutely. Um, yeah, within Hein Online, yes, certainly. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, I suppose, like all, to an extent, tertiary sources, it, 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 it gives you um, uh, the, um, yeah, the uh, it's it's a good it's a good overview. Great, and that's it for yeah for other people that might be something to look at is is the modern legal system encyclopedia. Um, so we don't we I know people have to start to going um, have to start going to other things, and I I don't want to keep everyone, but um, I just want to thank Howard very much. This was great, and it was really interesting to think about this in terms of the both the domestic. Oh. <laughs> I'm muted. Y'all can't hear me? I can hear you, Linda. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it, it, it's really great to listen to this or think about this in terms of both the domestic and the international and, and you know, and um, the interaction between those two, I, I, you know, rather than just looking, try, trying to look at individual um, systems, I think uh, that was a great way to, 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 to focus this. Um, it's really interesting examples that you gave there on that. And it's definitely one that a webinar that I will have to go back and listen to again, I think, to catch some of the things. So thank you so much for um, for all of that uh, that you covered and, and all of the resources you brought together. Um, because we are a little bit over time, I'm going to, I don't see any more questions coming in, but I will invite you to feel free to get in touch with Howard. Um, I think he has been very generous with his time with other people in the past um, and happy to help out. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somebody wants you to release the beagle. Um, I, I will be posting this to YouTube within the next week um, and I will be, uh, I can include the PowerPoints as well on the YouTube slide so that you'll have access to that. Um, so definitely um, we'll send that out to everyone who registered for the session. Oh, there's the beagle. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part about uh, Zoom life um, work from home is the fact that we get to see the, 
the animals um, uh, everybody has. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you again, Howard. Um, yes, it's uh, Emily was saying that it's been very well explained, very, very well explained. And I definitely look forward to looking through the, sharing this with some of the people who work here and then we're looking through the PowerPoint as well. Um, okay, if there are no more questions coming in. Seeing none. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I hope to see you all April 22nd when we will be talking about the World Trade Organization. So we, we run a bit of an international organizations kick, um, international kick the, this uh, semester. Um, again, if you have any questions or have any topics or ideas, um, or if you'd like to do a presentation yourself, please get in touch with me. Um, my, I'll put my email in um, the, oh, I almost put my old email, put my new email in the chat. Um, feel free to get in touch with me and let me know. Um, and other than that, thank you. And I hope, hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Howard, so much. <laughs>